Welcome to our last concert, but we're so, are you excited to be here? Yes! yes! I am so excited to be here. Um, I, um, I have to go, I'm sorry. Um, so I just want to introduce my friends here. Ricardo Cobo, Louis Trampagnier, Christelle, yeah. Philip Candelier, Candeliria, Rafaela Smits, Mark Eden, and René Esquierdo. Could we have a warm applause to them? Yay! <laughs> anyway, they came from far, and you're going to hear them play. But, but I, I really wanted to invite them all out here tonight to say, you know, a, a, talk a little bit about Leo Brower. And um, I'm just going to start with a question, and then we'll sort of go around and I'll ask you. But my first question is, is how, how do you think Leo's music has influenced our generation of guitarists, or younger generations, technically or, or musically? In what way do you think his, his music has, has it influenced? I'm gonna go, Ricardo, go! Um, I'll speak from, from experience. Um, I grew up in, a, in, in Colombia, where there was a little guitar in the 60s and 70s, but it was really a cookie cutter guitar. So you heard Sor, Aguado, Giuliani, uh, all the basics were part of the methodology. Brower sort of crept in in the 70s, and when, when a few of the pieces finally made it inside the concert halls, uh, you know, folks were dumbfounded. They, they said, what is that? You know, what, what is that? That's so completely different. It's, it's totally over the top. And it's impossible to play. <laughs> so at that time, it was, a, it was a knock on the door. A big animal is, is at your door. Something, you know, there's a game changer in the guitar rep. And that's what it did for me. It opened the door to uh, a whole new definition of what classical music was. And I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was going to be free pizza at this thing. That's why I'm here. No, there uh, is. There is. My, it's being brought in, actually. The, I mean, I, the first repertoire I worked on with my, my guitar teacher when I started lessons were the, the Brower Simple Etudes. Uh, one and two right away, and in in his etudes one and two, I mean, you have it all, right? You have big rhythm, exciting things, and then in the second one, this beautiful chorale, and there's the guitar's voice of uh, contrapuntal rhythms and, and warm orchestral type colors. And I mean, the things that were written above uh, in the in the the second etude, the chorale, as you know, colors of the inner voices and things like that. And they are beautifully simple pieces, but they do speak to the depth of what the guitar can do, like before him Chopin did for the piano and things like that. I mean, he, that's who he is for us. He's one of our fundamental composers. And I think after probably the Villa Lobo studies, which stand as this um, basic architecture of what the guitar's training needs to be, Brouwer repertoire is the same thing. I mean, he speaks of the modern world of guitar, or the modern world reflected in the guitar and things like that. So, well, that wasn't prepared, by the way. It's very good. Thank it's you. Very good. Well done. Well done. I think I wore a black shirt for the part of I know. <laughs> <laughs> no one said it was black dress code. I'm afraid. Sorry. Uh, but I think um, going back on what you were saying, I, th I think whether it's Brower at his most simple or at his most complicated, the music speaks directly uh, to both player and and listener, and particularly for myself and. Uh, my duo partner, Mark, uh, it was very important to our development as a duo. In fact, I think the very first repertoire we, we started with were, of course, the micropieces, which are a classic example of how Brower understands everything about the instrument, the color, the articulation, the rhythm. And within those, at that time, four very short pieces uh, that taught us so much, uh, about musicianship, technique, and everything else. So I think, uh, I think it's Brower's ability also to know exactly how to judge uh, structure, how to judge timbre, and, uh, and really we've had a, a sort of, uh, we, we've played many different things, and, and tonight you'll, you'll hear something a little bit more extended, but uh, I think that, for me, is what Brower's about. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I recall showing up many years ago at the first Toronto Guitar Festival. This was back in 1975. And I had, as a young lad, had a, had a lesson with a guitarist, American guitarist named Michael Lorimer. And I saw him uh, on the first day of the festival, and I said, why are you here, you know? And he said, 
I've come across the country for one reason, and that's to take the master class with Leo Brower at this festival. And I hadn't really heard of Leo Brower at that point. I was, I was quite young, and, and I was impressed that this professional guitarist that I knew had come all the way just for this one man. And then at the festival, when I heard Leo Brower play a concert, I, I understood the excitement, and I started going to every class at that festival that, uh, that Brower gave. And um, what struck me was that it was the first guitarist that I saw playing the, the contemporary repertoire on a level with what I was seeing in, in other instruments, with the, with the, with the, the famous uh, uh, people that were playing Stockhausen and Zanakis and these very, very far out music. And I hadn't heard guitarists do that up to this point. And of course, he seemed to spark that kind of interest in a lot of young guitarists. And for me, that's a, a lasting legacy for sure. Well, for me, um, I think we, we must be like from the same generation because something similar happened with me in Belgium. My father, he took me as a young teenager to, to a concert and there was Leo Brouwer playing solo and he brought also his duo partner, Oscar Caceres, with him. And when they started to play together, they played like this and with kind of percussion things. And that was, I was so attracted to this kind of music. And then I was first very annoyed by the public who started to laugh because we never heard this. And it was like, who is going to tap on a guitar? Is he completely crazy? But then after a while, we, we got really into the music and it was so... Ugh. It was more than first class, it was fantastic. And for me, it was like the, the key for the contemporary music. And later on, I had uh, several meetings and, and classes, etc. But um, I think it was an experience, a life experience. I will remember that moment forever, that uh, this great musician and would be later like one of the best known composers and uh, sharing this with all young and older people, because it's really great that a composer can write something very simple in a fantastic, beautiful form, and also that you can learn to play the guitar through this good music. I think that's really important for us, that it's not only from the 19th century, but that we have someone like that in the 20th century. I don't know how much I can actually add to all of that. <laughs> Um, I can give you the question again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, only, you know, as a personal thing about Brower, I mean, having uh, grown up, and in, in the UK, we have this kind of graded system for, for kids to do music, and through the grades, you play a lot of Leo Brower's music, and I never forget doing my grade eight, which is the last final grade before I went to music college, and I play Alojio de la Danza, and, um, and that was my real first experience of, of modern music, and I think because Brow has achieved such a huge range and diversity of styles, um, and, and again, because the music is such a high quality, um, you really can't go wrong by sort of, you know, learning from his, his music, and it's a wonderful gift for all the people who play classical guitar. Well, um, I just could add that um, Leo Brower in Cuba is, is the guitar. Like, it was guitar prior Leo Brower and guitar after Leo Brower. Uh, all, uh, I started playing classical guitar. It was in 1984. I heard um, a concert by Costas Kotsiolis. And he was playing a huge program. I remember I was a kid and I was pretty uninterested, this guy with the guitar on the stage. And then he played... Uh, I think Ricardo, you're playing today, the black the camera, and I felt like all my hairs like going up, and I I couldn't describe. It was the first time I got such a sensation from music at all to that level. I was very heavy into sports and to anything but music. And after that, my father um, gave me a tape of that recording, and I heard it for a whole year, every night. I heard that concert and especially Brower. And not surprisingly, I mean, he planned it carefully, you know, eventually I told him, I think I want to play guitar. <laughs> and my mother was very much against it, but <laughs> here I am, you know. Um, 
so uh, the, the guitar in Cuba is, is just what Brower have brought it to the rest of the world. It's incredible the, the manner in which he can um, unify and still sound Cuban in the most modern of pieces. There's these elements that are always in his music throughout. And um, it's, it's hard to describe how in, in like Canticon, I still hear some, you know, right, right, Afro-Cuban right. music right in it and, and how he can use it and loop and... Right. <laughs> the, I might yeah. <laughs> always. I mean, I mean, I think one of the things that's astounding for me when I think of Leo Brower is that I don't think there's any other instrument that has a living composer that is so dominating the the hearts, minds, and fingers of of their instrument. And and I think that we are really lucky, blessed to have this person that, you know, we've most, as everybody here met him, right? So have all met him. And and what I also think is amazing is that, you know, there's no student of ours that hasn't played Leo Brower. Not only hasn't played it, but I've never met anybody that has said, Ugh, I hate this music. I mean, it's just just the opposite. It, it, it brings them to the guitar, which, so, so I think that puts him in a unique place. And we all know that he, he has written so much music, not just guitar music, obviously film music and orchestra music, chamber music, ballet. Um, but it does get from where Rene left off. I mean, why do you think his music is so enduring? Why do you think it communicates to uh, a 13-year-old and or a, um, you know, a, a concert artist? Well, first, I think it's very idiomatic for the instrument, so it translates very well for the guitar. It makes the guitar sound amazing. It's it makes yeah. the guitar sound amazing. Can can you can Rafaela? Can you say more about that? What, why does it, why does it make the guitar sound amazing? What? Because that is so. I'm just picking you. I'm sorry. I just decided to, to move it around. Well, because he knows the instrument more than anyone else, and he's capable of. Uh, it's true. He writes idiomatic, but it's not like he only uses the open strings, it's just like he knows how to compose for the instrument. And of course, as a, as a child, um, that's, that's just uh, fun to do. You don't have to fight against the instrument, at least. You have to practice hard. It's not easy, not every piece is easy. But everything what he writes is possible to play, and that's really great, that's only... Yeah, that's what we, what we want, of course. Um, and then I think also what for, for myself is interesting, I love the, the construction of his work. So it's very understandable how he writes. It's really like he composes with whatever elements he's using, he composes his composition with. And um, that's for me anyway, I like to understand what I'm playing. I hate to play something that I don't know what I'm doing, if I'm just trying to start and end. Uh, so I really want to know the composition and he's so, such a great composer as a composer. Um, and he is also capable of using so many colors that we were not used uh, in, in much different music. And the guitar is like one of these instruments that, um, at least for me, it's an instrument I love since 40 years. And one of the, of the main reasons is because of the so uh, colorful possibilities. We don't have to use them all the time, but we have so many possibilities in that instrument. And I think Brouwer, he, he just discovered also all these uh, possibilities and ga gave it into our hands within good compositions. Does anybody else want to say anything about how, why his music is, you know, endure, what, what makes it so enduring? There's, there's sort of, if you, if you do a lot of his music or you see a lot of it, he, he quotes himself all the time. And I think he's beautifully um, almost unself-aware or unself-critical or some people would say, oh, I'm not going to quote myself. Or I don't think he worries one way or the other. He writes, he moves forward. It's so, so while you're asking why it's so strong, I think it's, it's very pure that way. It's, it's, right. It's, what, yeah, you know, as a Buddhist, you'd have that. that you'd, you'd appreciate, it, I'm sure. And 
And the other thing is, I, I heard him say in masterclass on different occasions many times, he says, you know, the piece I wrote, it's nothing until somebody plays it, right? Right, So right. This, this huge respect for the performance of a work and the fact that a work is a living, breathing thing and will evolve and be different and is like a child that right. is out there right. to be a self-actualized. Right. So those things together, I think, go far. Yes, I was just going to add also that I think he's, he's not a guitar composer. He's foremostly, he's a composer with a great knowledge and understanding of the instrument. So he's working on a much bigger scale. And I think all his pieces uh, are not, uh, they use obviously the, the, the guitar's sort of natural techniques, but it, they're, they're working on a much bigger tapestry and they're not confined. He's very much sort of moving out of the mold. And, uh, and like you said, you know, he's, he's, his music has, a, has an expressive freedom, which is given to the artist. Right. It's amazing. Uh-oh, now we're off. Yeah, yeah we're off. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, no, I just want to say that I never forget Stephen Dodgson saying, because Leo and Stephen Dodgson are like good mates. Everybody knows Stephen Dodgson, great English composer. Okay, well, he's written a lot of guitar music, and I think Stephen Dodgson is kind of, you know, he's, he's not a player, but he's got like an instinct for writing for guitar. But he said that Leo is the, is the most instinctive composer he knows, and I think that's the thing. You know, he's, he's not self-conscious. He just writes things, and it is absolutely right. You know, anything rhythmic, some figuration, a phrase, he just knows how much to do it. He never goes on too long. He never gives enough. Right, you know, it's, right. it's just fantastic. And, and again, about the resonance you were talking about. You know, I never forget, he came in to the academy once and, and I get a fantastic master class and he, he sat down and started playing the Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata on the, uh, and, on the piano there and he just played the opening chords and then stopped and looked around at us and just said, this is my music, it's all about resonance, and that's how he makes the guitar work. He just understands how to make the guitar resonate. Yeah, great, great, great comment. Um, we, it, the, if, if in generations to come, if they look through the window of Leo Brower's music, what do you think his music would tell them about our society, our, where we are, who we are as people? What, what kind of trio would Leo, would Leo be? I mean, what, is it, what do you think people would learn from in, in, in future generations about us, about music, uh, through his music? That's a difficult question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know it's difficult. We have, to, we have to come back next okay. year <laughs> to answer this We can question. move on if, that's, if you want to move on. Okay. He, he, he moves forward. He's constantly... Um, he changes and evolves as yes. a composer. You know, his, his music has dramatically changed over the years, and I think that's something that reflects our society, this sort of moving on, accepting change, but not forgetting... You Musically, know, do you think he's influenced by other, for instance, other genres that have influenced you? think minimalism had a play in his... Absolutely, right? yes, So they would learn definitely. from that and... and yeah. Yeah, and then there's the aleatoric music of the right. 1970s, that kind of all the contemporary scene, which is a vast change from some of the, the stuff, even things like the Sonata, which is, uh, you know, by, by, uh, by the standards of some of the stuff coming out in the 70s, quite tonal. And so I think, I think this whole thing of moving forward and changing and always rethinking about, I know that the piece we play tonight, he sort of rejects that style now in many ways, but it's a very important work. Yeah, absolutely. It's a absolutely. very important work in, in, in the sort of progression of it. And I think that reflects the, the sort of society we live in, massively fast changing. And also, the, I, mean, I was pace. just thinking musically too. I mean, Renee is speaking about the, the Afro Cuban, you know, rhythms constantly. I mean, rhythm is yeah. definitely. Everything he writes is a ballet in one form or another. I mean, yeah. like if, if, you, if you listen to every work tonight, there's going to be quite a wide variety of. Um, of language in lots of ways, but I, I know everything that we play tonight could be set to various styles of choreography and they would be very well met by movement. Like the, the, the concept of dance that is movement and lines and architecture and all those things together, they would... Yeah. How would you describe his color as opposed to other, other composers? I mean... Say, Maybe say he more. wanted to answer I'll that. I'll throw it to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Um, uh, when I started to play Brower as a kid, I didn't quite understand it. And then I remember seeing Kandinsky for the first time 
like the use of contrast and yeah. you know the way the whole picture evolved, how it creates a sensation of, com of complete or, or, or a finished product. That I always see on Brower's on Brower's music as well. And, 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 and just to say that, like his pieces that he wrote when he was 17, 16, 18 years old, are still music that never gets old. Like it's uh, timeless. Yeah. yeah, kids kids right now like it as much, you know. Absolutely, I think. And, it's and they they find something new every time in his music. And Brower encourages as a composer that he wants you to take charge. And, and, and kind of recomposed as you go along. I mean, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about when you asked earlier, you know, how we would see him in the future. Right. And it is a hard question, but I think that, that there's a legacy that we can already see emerging because of these different periods that he's gone through. You know, I really think of people like uh, Picasso, sure. uh, Stravinsky, that have gone through early phases, classic phases, um, rap going back and tying things together. And there's this huge legacy now that we have from this man that I think will stand the test of time and people will look back and see not just uh, someone who wrote idiomatic music that works on the instrument, but he covered these different stylistic periods and, and there's a continuous uh, degree of excellence through all of them. Right, right, yeah. I, I would, would really love to say something because we are thinking like in solo works and I think uh, Leo Brower, he wrote like the top of the guitar concertos and they yes. are really underplayed and I hope that in future that will show also an aspect of this incredible composer with different possibilities and um, because that's really a pity I think in the in his orchestral works and the way how he uses the orchestra is just like an amplification of how he uses the guitar yeah. and I, I hope really that will be like the future not only this small cute little pieces which and, cha which we, and chamber music as well yes and chamber, chamber music. music and so that's that's also an aspect where he probably hopefully in 20 30 40 years he will be big in yeah uh, <laughs> go man i i just wanted to say if if you're a shredder if you have a rock and roll background this is i mean you know i'm, I'm hispanic and, and i grew up in a different country but guitar was an icon it wasn't just a little nylon string instrument you play in your living room for your family. It was, it was actually a, a huge thing. It was a phenomenon. It was electric, it was acoustic, it was steel string. It had, you know, it had many brothers and sisters. So for whatever reasons, the, the, you know, in answer to the original, one of the original questions, what makes it so timeless? Well, the music has this, this broad appeal through the guitar. You know, every guitarist, you know, most of the kids that I teach here in the States, have a very heavy duty rock and roll Metallica background. The moment I put Brower in front of them, they light up. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like something has, something has happened that would never happen with Aguado. Not that Aguado is bad, but something really happens to these kids' minds and they immediately get it. The lights go on. The other thing is, is the music it has, a, has a, this tremendous crossover without using, misusing the word. It crosses over into a lot of different other areas of culture and the arts, and yeah. it identifies with them directly. I think that's... Part of the, yeah. How it reflects the modern world, too, the world we live in, is that it's... Yeah, I was thinking musically, too, absolutely. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it always happens. It's, we, we're, I, we're getting so close to be out of time. Um, any anecdotes, just... Uh, oh, I, I, I will say one thing to lead it off. Uh, uh, I was very lucky to uh, study with Leo Brower in, in Arles, France, and every morning he would come and practice before us, before he would teach, he would sit down and play for, for you know, if, if you got, uh, sometimes he'd show up, first of all, he'd stay up all night, so I don't think the guy ever slept, um, and then he would show up and practice in front of you, and it was, it was the most marvelous teaching. We all know him as an extraordinary teacher, but to see him play, and Renee talking about color, I mean, that was constantly, his, his right hand just could not stand to stay in one place. It's all over the guitar. But it was a very moving, uh, very moving experience for me, and I think anybody, to, to see him every morning there and, in, in, uh, you know, going at it. But that having been said, any, any stories or quick anecdotes about Leo that you want to say? Very, very quick. <laughs> when uh, I met him in 1990, and 
he sat with the students, this is during the Alirio Diaz competition, and he refused to deal with any official business. So he sat with all his students, and at the, the, the final day of the, of the contest, all the results were in, he insisted that all his students sit with him. It was like the Last Supper. And he said, here's a guitar, play something. And he gave us each a chance to play. He says, play whatever you want, and then he played. And, and it was really something, something to watch. I, I just like when, when Leo grabs a student's, well, grabs is not the right word, takes a student's guitar to give him an example in a master class. He can't help showing off just a little bit, you know? Like he'll, oh, nice guitar. Then everybody's watching him, and he'll go. Because, I mean, his left hand, honestly, it's just, so he'll, oh, yes. Oh, what's I saying? Oh, yes. Then he gets back into it. And he knows, like, he's, and his music is so much, it isn't, the music, uh, the, the music of somebody who's a show-off. His music isn't showing off. But I love that he's like a child that way. Because, I mean, that's what he says in a master class. The student finishes, oh, perfecto. Then, okay, change this, that, you know. But he's so positive, and yeah, I like that about him. Incredibly positive. I think just very quickly to add that we had a class very many years ago at the Academy with Leo, and, uh, and uh, just the words that he gave us in that class, it was nearly 20 years ago now when we first started, were enough, really, to springboard us forward for the next 10. I mean, it really was. Absolutely, for prolific. a lifetime, yeah. Um, he just patted me on the back and said, I like this duo, and that was about it. No, but he took, <laughs> us, he, he, he took us through, it was such an inspirational uh, class, and, and so much to learn, so much to think about, that um, it just ignited something in us, really, and so we're very grateful to him for, for sort of starting it Great. off. I remember the first class that I sat in on him teaching, he had everyone in the room pick up the guitar, and he said, now make the most beautiful chord you can. And so we, we would play a chord, and he would just, he loved every one, of course. He, he was so supportive as a teacher. Uh, and then one fellow came up with a very interesting, almost Brindlesque kind of chord, and he just, his, his face was uh, beautific. I mean, he has this smile, it was radiant. And he just loved the sound of the guitar, and he made us love making sounds on the guitar. It was a very, very wonderful teacher. Okay, I will try to, to speak quick. So, um, when I took a class with him that was on a, a master class in Belgium, and so I prepared, I didn't prepare for the master class because it was, he was such a young but impressive master that nobody else wanted to play, so they asked me to play. And I was just working on a Brouwer programs. I was so lucky. So whatever was written before the 80s I had on my program. And... Um, so I started playing, and he really liked it. And he said, you know what? Uh, he, he really liked it. And then he said, let me just conduct you. And I thought that was, for me, it was a beautiful master class because he was just standing next to me <laughs> and making these movements how, if, if I would, was an orchestra, he was just putting out of putting in, you know? And that was, uh, it, yeah, I think it was one of the best master classes I had. He never changed the fingering, or he didn't really... Um, you wouldn't touch what he changed, but I changed. I once saw him conduct John Williams playing Petrassi's Nunc. He was turning, turning pages, and John would be playing like this. And, <laughs> and Joe's like, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Well, just John Williams on his own. Yeah, no, no, John, yeah, 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 John. He was turning pages for John Williams. Oh. John was playing Petrassi's Nunc, okay. and Leo was turning pages, but <laughs> while turning, you know, when he wasn't turning pages, he was going, <laughs> As only Leo could do, and John was like, <laughs> yes, that's it's insanely just ignoring him. funny. It would be the best YouTube. Anyway, go ahead. Um, I don't know if I've got anything really anecdotal, but I mean, we, uh, we once did a concert about 10 years ago in Cambridge, and, um, and we turned up, and we, we were standing in for, actually, we were standing in for Julian Bream, because he was just suddenly very ill, and we got this call from the, his agent to say, can we do this concert? Anyway, we turned up, and we had, we'd done a concert the night before, and we did this one, and we just thought, oh, it's just going to be a regular concert, and we, and we went and did a little, <laughs> uh, you know, have a look at the place where we were playing in this beautiful, huge church, and in, as we went in, and Leo Brower's there, just pushing some chairs around into a little like circle like this. <laughs> We're like, what the hell is, what is Leo Brower? <laughs> like this, okay. And you know, there was that horrible feeling you get in your knees. You're like, <laughs> you know, and we're like, we just didn't expect this, you know, because normally I'd take about a few days to 
get my sort of you know anyway so we and we were really and we were really nervous because we were playing a, a Beatles arrangement by him and we hadn't asked his permission because it was like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a, of a photocopy <laughs> like this and we were like thinking, and Chris and I were going we, we can't we can't play this piece we'll have to we'll have to take it out and stuff and in fact we were yeah it was terrible anyway that was a disaster yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. well um Actually, one of the most fond memories I have of, of Leo, um, well, every two years we had this Havana Guitar Festival and competition, and that was our input. Every two years of see what the world was about, and, and Leo Brower bringing all these composers and, and bringing all these musicians, guitarists, to, to play, to, to talk, to teach us. Um, actually, it was in a concert by Alvaro Pierri. I remember that we were... Uh, outside the Sala Cuba Rubias, which is the National Theater. And we were students, we had no money, and like, uh, it was almost sold out, and, and when Brower found out that we were all outside, he just made, um, talked to Albert, of course, and he put like chairs all around Albert Perry, in just, uh, you know, and, and brought all the students to the stage, because he said, well, this concert is actually for you not for the audience, <laughs> you know, because he understood uh, our need for that and how something so trivial as money, you know. Right, right, right beautiful. Well, so, I hate to do this, but we have to stop, but thank you so much, everybody here. Thank you so much.